Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWenderlich.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Alex Sullivan. Thanks, Ray. This is the Ray Wenderlich podcast. Welcome to our first full episode for season 10. This episode was recorded early on Saturday, the 16th of February for release on the 26th of February, 2020. This episode is sponsored by the keyword fun and the irrational number E. I am Alex Sullivan here with my phenomenal co-host, Drew Freeman. I don't know if I can live up to that, but I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I'm Alex. Sure. <laughs> Riding along with us for this show is Ray Wenderlich author Lori Gray. Lori is a lead iOS developer and contractor. Baptized as a disciple of code and a joyful part of the Ray Wenderlich iOS video team, Lori also teaches on Udemy, is a total learnaholic, and has enthusiasm that has been known to overwhelm. On this episode, Lori will help us dive into Apple's relatively recent reactive technology, Swift UI. Later, Drew will try to convince us you can teach an old dog new tricks as he ramps up on MVVM. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm so glad you could join us for this first episode, and it's going to be quite, a, quite an interesting one. So I have to start out by asking, Disciple of Code, how did you mm. come up with that? Because that, that's your website, that's your, your Twitter. What, what was it that, that made you a Disciple of Code? Yeah, so my background is probably the, the source for this. Um, obviously, um, I got into programming later on rather than the traditional route of going down university route. And, uh, you know, I wish I had done it that way, but the way things turned out, it was more interesting this way. And I think the sheer intensity in which I had, so I had to learn um, iOS back in the days of Objective-C and Swift at the same time, um, I just seemed to enjoy maintaining that level of intensity. And I kind of always just... I saw it as my, my raison d'etre, my calling really to be a successful iOS developer and I was going to master this no matter what it took <laughs> uh, with a with full-time job and, and a family and things and I always seem to enjoy keeping that up rather than letting it taper off and so I've kind of uh, developed this strange enthusiasm which um, people tend to love eventually, <laughs> if not right away, hopefully, uh, just I see it as you know, me want to be the best developer I can be. And so it is my calling to be a disciple of code. That was just the way I sort of embodied that idea. Strange uh, enthusiasm. You mean enthusiasm that overwhelms? <laughs> yeah, I'm interested <laughs> where you got that. I got that right off the Ray Wenderlich site, so it's, it's your words. <laughs> yeah, I think I might have written that when I had too many coffees, which is also <laughs> another trait I have. Um, and I forget what I did, you know, completely different personality, basically. <laughs> you know? well, so we're recording at about 9 a.m. here on the East Coast of the U.S. And you're, you're in London, so it's about uh, 2, 2, 3 o'clock? Yeah, 2 o'clock, yeah. So, so your coffee is settling in and our coffee is just beginning to... It's to just <laughs> ramping up. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. part of the problem with having so many kids that you need to just adopt coffee. Otherwise, you know, you're just going <laughs> to sleep forever. You know? so, <laughs> All right, so now you've walked into that one. How many kids have you got? So I have five kids. Um, oh, my goodness. Originally, <laughs> originally, I had three and then we had a surprise. Uh, and that surprise turned out to be twins. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's been really interesting, um, you know, um, it keeps me going for sure. <laughs> how, how old? Uh, nine, seven, five, and both twins are almost two years old. Oh, wow. my heavens. Yeah, that sounds like a handful. <laughs> yes. Does a nine-year-old help at this point, or is the nine-year-old more of a hindrance? Yeah, so it's actually miraculous how this worked out, that the kids play with each other, which it's like having a school session all the time, but everyone's having a good time usually. So it just needs the odd uh, bit of uh, you know making sure no one's misbehaving, and they keep playing and and play with each other, it's great fun, so, yeah. And I'm guessing Harry Potter fans from the poster behind you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, that's me, actually. Um, <laughs> so, um, I just moved here, so it would be lots more there if I had more time, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's platform nine and three quarters well, here, of course. With five kids, there is no such thing as time anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you do to, to fill the time when it's not the kids or the code? So most of my time is, is spent learning uh, in general. Uh, I have a, a real thing about learning. I, I know everyone does, so otherwise they wouldn't be in this job. Otherwise you'd be mad. Um, but I, I tend to go over and above in a lot of that. So um, I don't watch a lot of TV and things. So usually I like to study languages or, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, but to be fair, most of my time is with the kids. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, 
recently I've been doing, um, you know, I do some foreign languages and things and I'm hoping to travel abroad and try and use that. Uh, I kind of enjoy that kind of thing. And there are links between code and languages, um, but oh, it's a bit more cool. relaxing than doing code all the time. So, What, uh, what foreign languages? Uh, so uh, about three or four years ago, my brother uh, and I went to China and the, the goal was to not speak any English for me. <laughs> uh, so I almost managed that um, most of the time when we sort of went into the middle of nowhere with no um, tourist areas and ended up just having to survive basically. <laughs> it worked pretty well, you know, so uh, that's been what I focused on most recently. It's been uh, Hebrew, so I'm looking to travel over into a hotter part of the, the world and, and try, try that out. So, yeah. Very cool. What, what, got, what, well, we know you're a learnaholic, but what was it about Swift UI that piqued your interest other than completely different? So the story behind the Swift UI course um, is an interesting one. Um, originally, I was brought onto the team to do a programmatic uh, UI course. Uh, there was, seemed to be a lot of interest in you know, getting complete control over user interfaces, you know, not using storyboards, not using nibs, uh, but using just focus on programmatic UI. Mm -hmm. So I had written most of the course, I'd built in the app, which was largely a sort of entertainment app for cats. Um, <laughs> just an idea I got uh, and Ray seemed to like the idea, so he let me go off in my eccentric imagination and create this <laughs> entire uh, thing. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, we were actually live in the Ray Wendelik chat when WWDC was, was, was live. And uh, suddenly, I could <laughs> see all the constraints on the screen that I would use to make a UI. It said, this is what you would usually use to make a UI. And I was thinking, Yes, usually. <laughs> <laughs> the whole screen just went blank, and suddenly this new stuff appeared, and he went, well, this is Swift UI. And then Ray just immediately messaged me and said, my condolences on the course. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. So part of, part of me was so happy, and another part of me was also thinking, well, that was a waste of, uh, a waste of work. No one's going to get to see this uh, cat app, app um, you know. Well, so, the, the, they may see the app, but it may be entirely rewritten. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the thing was, I had benefited so much from, you know, studying a lot of programmatic UI anyway, so that actually paid off, uh, especially we just reused a similar idea for Swift UI. Um, but it kind of, after that, Ray said, well, would you be happy to do the same kind of thing, but in Swift UI? So that was a big challenge because at that time, there were no courses, there was very little resources, and mm. the documentation I was using would go 404 and not be there now and just change. <laughs> Uh, and so we had to rewrite that app at least five times, I think it was, to, to match the, the beta oh, wow. change. And, yeah. And Dub, WWDC, it, it had gotten a reputation the past few years of being a little light on the, the technologies. You know, you get one or two um, enhancement technologies, but then, then 2019 hit and, and it was like a tactical blast. It, it was a grenade of, of knowledge and I was very fortunate to be on site for that one and and I, I was astounded by what came up uh, Swift UI being pretty much I think everyone referred to it as a game changer but mm -hmm. uh, I don't envy you because Swift UI went through so many changes during the beta phase didn't it yeah and um, the tech editor who worked with me my good friend Antonio Bello who's part of the team um, we used to laugh and cry um, late evenings yeah, when, when another beta would change or <laughs> something else was broken. And with the way Swift UI works, sometimes it's not very good at telling you where the problem is just with the way that it, the new syntax is. So we would really be scratching our heads and sort of asking around. And again, the resources just went there to show you how to do these things. So we kind of had to just figure it out as we went and hope that it was the right way because people would be copying what we did. and our paradigms and things. So mm -hmm. it was definitely a challenge. So would you, would you have to rewrite the entire app when a new beta came out? Uh, not, not quite, but the changes were significant. Um, and it would mean that um, a lot of things would have to change generally, um, structurally. I mean, even things with the way that, you know, originally they started with how to actually pass data down into views and that slightly changed and everything had to be sort of rewritten round and then re-edited and, and checked again. Eventually, we just drew the line and said, we're, we're, we're calling it on this. Yeah. We're going to film it. But, but even when we were filming, like, literally the day before, things had Everything changed slightly. Changed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, everyone was so stressed out, you know, and, like walking around trying to figure it out. So, yeah, it was definitely a good, thing, good fun, you know. So let's, let's back up and talk about 
from a 20,000 foot view, what is Swift UI in comparison to what people have already been familiar with? Yeah, I think Swift UI is a very ambitious uh, and bold move from Apple to bring uh, UI design into a much more uh, simpler realm for people, especially new people to pick up, uh, but also for existing developers to simplify how we do things. Um, you know, one of the uh, examples is that you know we, we use a lot in the courses to show you the sheer difference in size of files required to achieve the same result. I think Apple's uh, mantra was it's the short, short, the quicker way to a better app, and um, basically that that is just the epitome of it all. You can have table views, collection views, and just a few lines, and you can change the entire layout with just one tiny change. Whereas before we would need you know, storyboards, nibs, classes, cells all that just to achieve this one effect. So they've really managed to reduce how much work we need to create UIs. And it's a shift towards uh, the more, um, the, the other libraries that are out there that are more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> so what's, the, what's the term I forgot already, sorry. Um, <laughs> Where did I get to in that statement? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we did that again and just simplify it. Really <laughs> this happened a lot when we were filming the course, by the way. I've got the best oh, outtakes yeah. ever just with me. Like, so. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that's, that's gone away with Swift UI is there is no z zibs, nibs, storyboards, et cetera, which from my point of view, working on a very large team right now with multiple iOS developers means I've no longer got to hack my way through a merge on Git, mm. and that makes me very, very happy. Yeah, that's for people who are looking at uh, pull requests day in and day out, like yourself and myself, it makes such a huge difference because... Part of the process for that was just ignoring nibs and storyboards. I mean, really, some people probably can read all that XML, but <laughs> in general, you, you're very rarely going to look over that, and, and you can't really see where it's going. But with the way the declarative UI is, you can actually just read it right there. The hierarchy is described. You can see how it's going to respond. It's just going to change everything for the better. And IB designable is gone. Yeah, so, yeah, merge conflicts and um, also layout constraint issues that appear, mm. unsatisfiable constraints. You see those all the time. Well, they're not going to exist anymore, so that's really oh, good. Oh, man. The logs will be so much prettier now. <laughs> and I won't feel so guilty whenever I look at whatever <laughs> thing I've thrown together. Love it. So what else would you say is, is one of the, po are the positives of Swift UI? One of the really interesting things that happened in WWDC that I wasn't expecting uh, when I was doing my research for making the course was the support for accessibility. Um, you know, if we're being honest, accessibility can be an afterthought, uh, especially when we're building large applications. Mm -hmm. But seeing the way that they came at it with putting that first and almost for free a lot of the time, you have to do very little to support that, which is phenomenal. Uh, and seeing the impact with actually having people who rely on that technology on stage showing you how that would work was just absolutely fantastic. And it was so so simple that you had to implement that, and it just gave us all the tools we needed to make that better for people. So that was a big surprise. Localization seems to be a lot easier in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's just the, this, the things that we need to write lots of code to do, like localization, just seem to be reduced greatly, which is great for us. So with SwiftUI, you're dealing more now with, with state. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so one of the traditional things that you mentioned MVVM earlier, one of the traditional things that we have to do is we need a view that relies on some sort of state or data. And whenever that data changes, we want to update the view and vice versa. So we want some uh, bi-directional binding there that's, you know, that we can react to, as it were. To do that, you could use libraries like RxSwift, which have a large uh, learning curve. And if you want to invest your time in it, that's great. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then we have a kind of smattering of other technologies that we could piece together to get that effect. But with state uh, and the way SwiftUI works, uh, we have that support, the full complete solution straight from Apple. Uh, and basically, it allows us to um, set aside our state and, and memory where our views are actually uh, value types. Our state is a reference type set aside. It doesn't clog up uh, the view code at all. And whenever something updates in the state, it will trigger a re-render for a very specific part of that UI that relies on it and will update it for us, effort-free, and the code size is much smaller. 
Would you say that coming into it that this is easier or harder from somebody who's coming to iOS with no background whatsoever than say UI kit was? I think that um, in terms of the way state drives use, uh, probably because uh, a lot of people have been exposed to things like React Native, which is very much driven in the same way. And uh, maybe they have you know, tinkered with that and moved to iOS and wanted to deep dive. Um, but in regards to the way that the views are laid out, I think that it's still going to be challenging because we're still going to rely on UIKit and Swift UI at the same time, which is kind of like the days of taking up iOS and Objective-C and Swift days where we weren't quite decided uh, and we need to do both. So there's, there's going to be a lot to learn there. One, um, one thing I've found really nice as I've done um, iOS and Android development work is being able to, to see the UI as I design it. So if I'm in um, the interface builder, then I can usually see what's going on as I'm setting up the constraints. Do you think that's going to be a challenge for newcomers? Actually, can you do that with Swift UI? Do you get that, like, what you see is what you get sort of feedback there? Yeah, so the, one of the real temptations with uh, the libraries like React Native was, yeah, you get live rendering, you don't have to rebuild, uh, and you can focus on that screen. But Swift UI gave us instant updates for not only different screen sizes, we're talking like individual views. We can focus right in on something, uh, like a, how something looks on a certain device right there, and it is so fast. It's, it's incredible. Oh, that's and amazing. One of the real benefits of that is if, if we're working with designers and they have an issue, they can come over there and say, well, how does this look in this situation? And you can just literally just type a few things and it'll appear in all those different situations. And it's a really interactive process, which is, which is great. That's and the nice cool. thing is that you can really just pull out sub views rather than have to render the entire thing. You can say, okay, I'm going to make this specific sub view first. And that way I can see it in context with the full view or I can just focus in on it. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. You can focus in on sub views. You can focus in on as small as views as you want. In fact, SwiftUI encourages you to make much smaller reusable components anyway. So it's a really simple thing to do. And I think yeah, under the hood, it's powered by Metal and it's so much faster than building and running. I mean, even yesterday I was working on something and I had to build and run and go through the hierarchy to get to the view that I wanted to see. Uh, all those days are thankfully going to be over soon. But you know, we can actually just power straight into one view and then when we're happy, We'll build at that point, so it's, it's really good. Also, Apple seems to have introduced a whole bunch of very small, basic components, as in shapes, so that you can build up custom controls fairly easily as well. Can you, uh, can you give us some information on that? Yeah, so <clears throat> Swift UI ships with a lot of primitive views, uh, buttons, toggles, um, and text and things. And basically, we can use that to compose uh, larger views. Um, I think coming back to the challenge for new people coming in is that some of these views aren't quite as powerful as UIKit's views. So, for example, in the recent course uh, drawing with SwiftUI, uh, basically we had to use both a UI scroll view and scroll views from SwiftUI to achieve the same effect. Uh, hopefully in time that these views will catch up and have the same functionality. Um, but for now, they're still very powerful because they update the way they look on different devices. So if you have a toggle on uh, Apple Watch, uh, you get that styling for free if you've built it using the native components, and that will change automatically when it moves to the iPad uh, or iPhone. It's incredible. Yeah, I don't want to go too far into things like Catalyst, but now with the, the fact that Swift UI is on Mac, on iOS, on the watch, this really makes it easier to have one coherent code base to do all of your, your applications that you'd have or your applications, apps, et cetera, uh, mixed together. Uh, yeah, that's really exciting for me because I had little experience building Mac apps before, so now I can tinker away and try building things uh, there. But I think the real benefit for me would be seeing my apps running automatically on Apple Watch, for example, which is quite a niche thing before, and now it's much more open to us. So my, my uh, Apple development skills are a bit rusty. Could you expand on that a little bit more? How does Swift UI kind of make the, the barrier between you know, iOS app development versus Apple Watch development easier? Uh, every developer probably has their area of expertise. Um, and Apple Watch is something that a lot of people don't spend a lot of time doing. Uh, and yet the apps are very useful and some fields very effective. So you'd have to spend quite a lot of time trying to understand how you know, things work there and 
you, you probably couldn't reuse all your code, but mm. perhaps parts of it, and it'd be quite hard to see how those things relate. But thanks to the way SwiftUI works, uh, the code should generally be identical, uh, and it will automatically update how it looks and behaves on that device, which is incredible. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it's the same for Mac OS apps as well. I mean, the the the, the niche that, that was there before was, was quite difficult to get into uh, because it's different from iOS, although there are some, some, some similarities there. But now the code is literally transferable from one to the other, which is really exciting. And, and so that wasn't the case before. Oops, sorry. No. no. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are similarities, but the, the classes would be different, the behaviors okay. would be different, and there'd be some knowledge that was really required there, um, but she wasn't as easily as, you know, regularly available as iOS stuff, which is much more popular. Cool. And, of course, we, we shouldn't be forgetting tvOS on top of that, which is also using... Swift UI and has the same code base capabilities. So you can create if you're if you're doing that kind of an application, you, you've got that that immediate access up and down the, the stack. I don't know if stack would be the proper word, but you know, yeah, yeah we're talking yeah. about the, the applications uh, for the different platforms. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, I haven't built anything on TVOS yet, but I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that when I get some of that free time that I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had an app that, that basically started as um, an, I, uh, an iWatch, an Apple Watch uh, application, but the Apple Watch application, this was back before it would, uh, required to be attached to an iOS application. So I grew an iOS application from the, uh, the small feature that was on the watch but once I had that, I was able to take one specific screen from the Apple Watch and put that uh, once uh, I was able to take one small screen from the iOS app and then move that to the TV. So it's, nice. it's sort of like a, a clock. Mm. Interesting. So, but it, it's interesting that you're able to, to take those segments and say, okay, so here are the specific controls that work here or don't work there. Uh, for example, I don't think the toggles or the switches work on an Apple TV. Mm. Um, search bar does. Uh, simple buttons do. But you, you, you basically can, can move back and forth across the platform, uh, uh, the line of platforms that there are now. The previews in SwiftUI that we get are sort of from a, a magical preview debug language. Can you talk a little bit about that? In the previews, they were recently updated uh, before they were wrapped in a, a macro that anything in there that was debug code would, would run for you. But now they can kind of automatically just show uh, when you activate the canvas. So you can just see everything rendering just fine. But the issue is with the actual syntax uh, in regards to how the, the cloud of UI works, it's kind of magical, you know. Uh, we have these views that we can create. But how that really works under the hood, we, we don't really know. <laughs> uh, I think that's the the issue with some people who are a bit hesitant to take up Swift UI, whereas with UIKit they have the full control. Do you feel that at this point, uh, let me let me back up. When when key value observing was introduced way back when, um, a lot of people said this is a really great technology, but it wasn't completely baked in version one. And Apple has admittedly a history of introducing phenomenal technologies that perhaps aren't completely baked. How do you feel Swift UI feel falls under that? I, I, I mean, it's, it's there, it's usable, it's great, but do you feel like we're still missing some components that will really make this thing easy and to sail on a ship? I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, the technology, uh, I, just sort of to summarize, wouldn't use it in production yet. Mm. Uh, having had that experience for those uh, months working with it, there's, there's still some issues, but the, the, the power and control definitely isn't still quite there yet for more realistic uh, user interfaces you would make in production, which are possibly more complex. And for example, when you're laying out things to handle different trait collections when the device rotates or goes into multitasking mode, uh, things can get quite verbose and we're going to have to wait and see how that actually scales uh, in terms of architecture over time because we just don't. There's some things we just don't know yet, you know. 
So we possibly could see a Swift 2 to Swift 3 transition. <laughs> I didn't bring this up because everyone, everyone exclusively has mentioned this. <laughs> that this great well, now, pain now in history. It's, <laughs> it's on the table. I'm putting down my cards and my chips. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, at the time, I, I was just so engrossed in learning everything anyway, so it didn't seem to phase me too much. But I think people had really invested their time in the apps and, and written Swift 1, Swift 2 apps, and things just suddenly went boom and changed, you know. Uh, that happened to me at least five times in the course of making this course. <laughs> <to answer progression>. <laughs> <laughs> so, possibly. <laughs> so, so it, it, it's usable, but it's also only available now for, for, for the current iOS 13. It's only available for the current Mac OS, et cetera. So you, you really can't support old users on this thing. It's, it's, would you say it's more still hobbyist or would you say that, you know, apps can go strong and live at this point? I have some uh, colleagues who have released their own stuff um, using Swift UI, but generally the interfaces are, are much uh, simpler. Uh, and, you know, repetitive things like table views and collection views, it, it's great. It, it works fantastic. It's way more maintainable. Um, and yeah, but definitely when you're locked into iOS 13, uh, and I'm not exactly sure why that is the case, but the fact that it is, it's going to, you know, stop people uh, adopting it earlier. Um, you know, most companies who are making apps are probably supporting at least 12, if not 11. Mm hmm you know, well, currently, I know that a lot of companies are supporting 13 through 12, at least, and 11, yeah, I agree, is, is still fairly important. And if you're a major company where you've got people who may still be on 9, you're, you're going to be trying to uh, at least check your, your, uh, your, your uh, support numbers to see what they're on. Yeah, and I would say this is really as a deal breaker for a lot of the developers I've spoken to. Um, I've always tried to keep the enthusiasm high for it because it, we're so blessed every year to get all this new stuff, uh, so we can't really complain. But uh, this one has definitely kept people back a little bit that I've sort of spoken to. Where they've, they've said, "We'll wait and see how this one goes before we adopt it," you know, um, because they literally can't use it until maybe a year's time. So now, so Swift UI has come out, and it's really fantastic and it does so many things so well are there any places at this point that you really you'll look at swift ui and you'll hit it and you'll hit your head on the wall and you'll realize no for this kind of app i still need to stay in ui kit yeah i mean apple have made it i think they've anticipated this um it's such a paradigm shift the the kind of apple way the, or the ios -y way whatever the term is that we're used to making apps is going to just completely change i mean our job is not going to look the same in the future um so they've made it really uh, easy to use both together which is quite frankly an incredible achievement uh, you can just host views or you can represent views from ui kit or swift ui and it respects the constraints, and it actually works pretty flawlessly, which is, which is really incredible, you know. Um, but yeah, there's, there's still going to be um, there's still going to be the need for an understanding of UI kit and storyboards and nibs and Swift UI uh, in order to really build apps today. Um, so the two scenarios are probably going to be that you start an app completely in Swift UI, uh, and then when you can't figure out how to do that thing. Uh, from UI kit, then you can just bring it in, if that makes sense, and just plug mm -hmm. UI kit in there <laughs> until it's updated or whatever. Um, but more realistically, we're probably looking at UI kit apps that exist, and there's a strong code base there, but people will just start to plug in Swift UI views mm -hmm. uh, using, yeah, using the... Um, sorry. Have you run into any situations where Swift UI didn't work for you and you did have to back into UI kit? Um, let's think. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that the recent course with drawing in iOS, uh, we had to use uh, both there. Thankfully, Caroline figured it all out and she did a great job. Um, I just happened to look at some of the code and I thought, nice work, thank you. <laughs> but I know that she worked really hard to figure that out. <laughs> um, she used a UI scroll view uh, to get full control. And then inside that, she used scroll views. But in order to do that, you need to rely on the geometry reader a component as well, which is a different idea altogether again. Uh, so that it can be a bit tricky uh, sometimes. Now, a lot of people are also wondering about SpriteKit and SceneKit, but those are specifically 
other UI systems for different types of apps. You're not going to be necessarily writing a gaming app in Swift UI. Swift UI is more for maintaining your your more util utilitarian type, not utilitarian, but utility style applications. Yeah, I think we're still going to see um, these these frameworks existing and still used really strongly. It's not there to replace everything. I think it's just just now the advantage is it can replace the sort of repetitive things that we do. I mean, every single day, if you're not building a table view, you're doing something wrong. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so with your table view, you've got your delegate, your data source, the cells, the styling, everything, and it's it's four or five files, one of which is unreadable, and now. We just have literally just a tiny block with a bit of logic in there. So I think it's really strong on that front. Are there any other places that you feel that Swift UI is going to be challenging to the end user or the end developer? I think it's going to be easier to adopt for new developers. Um, ironically, for existing UI kit, you know, people who are aficionados in that, um, they might regret or not like giving up their skill set because uh, you're literally handing over control and, and kind of getting the same effect. You know, people who are wizards at um, collection views and the things that they can do with them are just incredible. Um, you can kind of do that in Swift UI really simply for some of them, but in some of them you can't. Um, but part of that is understanding the new layout system, which is definitely going to be a challenge for people because. I really worked so hard in that video uh, for the course in Rewendelic to try and make it interesting and understandable how the views talk to each other. Uh, and the way I did that was to try and... Uh, I, I could relate to it with talking to my kids, trying to get them to do what I want them to do. Uh, and that's kind of the way we think and you like it. But in reality, the kids tell the parents what to do, let's be honest. And, and that's kind of the way it works in the new layout system. They literally say, nope. <laughs> and they pass that instruction back up. So um, that's going to be challenging. So does SwiftUI doesn't use constraints or anything like that? It does under the hood. It is using okay. constraints, and people have managed to somehow figure that out. Okay. Um, but thankfully now, um, I think they use the avocado toast example. Uh, and the, and oh the WWDC. We've discussed avocado toast yeah. in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I <said. laughs> yeah, I said. Um, so I, I had to try and use my own one in the course, which is the kids' example. But, but basically, the, the kind of moral behind that story is that um, before you would tell you know exactly how to make that toast, whereas now you just say to someone, can I get some toast that does this, or it looks like this and tastes like this, and it should just work. Um, so you're losing that control there, uh, and you're kind of trusting the layout system which most of the time works, but when it doesn't, then what do you do? <laughs> so how is, how is debugging in Swift UI? Because I know with UIKit now, if something isn't looking right, you stop the app and you have an exploded view, and you can look at the, uh, the values in each thing, but UI, uh, Swift UI is going to be completely different. How does debugging work? So for layout debugging, um, I'm not exactly sure if, if it's going to help you knowing how things are laid out differently and the constraints because you don't really have that control that might help diagnose that. But certainly for um, logic debugging or errors in your code, sometimes it's not very good at knowing where the issue lies. Um, so um, often, with the way I think the way the compiler works is it's almost like it's inverted, the way that it works in the way to your, the center of your code. So if your problem's in the middle somewhere, it can't quite get there. So it kind of just says, mm, and throws an error somewhere much further up, and you have to comment this out, comment that out to try and get to the source where you can say, oh, okay, I was passing the wrong thing in there, or you know, this, is, this isn't state, this is something else. And that was quite tricky in the course. We were trying to figure out where things were going wrong, and it could take some time. Now, you'd mentioned that a lot of people may be coming to Swift from, uh, from other reactive languages. Do you feel it is best to have an understanding of a reactive language before tackling Swift UI? Uh, yeah, so the my background, I had a little chance to use uh, React Native, um, and I know some, as a lover, hate and divide all <laughs> topic. Um, uh, but w one good thing that that taught me was that you can have a declarative sort of HTML system, but you can pass in the things that you need uh, state-wise. Um, what's even better about Swift UI though is not only is it native, but everything's in one file. So even with React Native, you're relying on style sheets maybe that are somewhere else. Um, whereas in SwiftUI, your styles are there, they're in the same file. 
um, and you can chop them down as small as you like. Um, but thankfully, the state system is really simple to grasp. Um, you've got your reference types, your value types, and you can choose which one suits you. I'm interested in how, uh, if you've done some React Native development, how did you find writing like the React, JSX, HTML sort of stuff versus the Swift UI views? Did you find one more intuitive or one easier? Uh, it's been a while since I used uh, React Native um, and React JS. Um, I, I didn't really mind using them because I was comfortable with JavaScript. Um, I much prefer uh, the Swift UI version of it though because it's more Swifty. Yeah. Um, uh, just because, you know, <laughs> it just seems like a much more swiftly way to do things. And I think Apple kind of got away with uh, sort of finally putting the things they wanted to do here. They said, look, we've got a clean slate. Let's do it right. You know, let's have, um, let's not have huge UI view classes that inherit from X, Y, and Z. Let's have a simple struct that's, um, you know, it's a value type and it only has one requirement, which is to show the view that, you know, return me some sort of view. And we also get to use the sum keyword, which means it can infer everything for you. It's like it's absolutely incredible. <laughs> so I think they kind of got away with getting all they wanted in there, uh, and they, it gives people a chance to really make a, a fresh start. Um, and whereas React Native is kind of, it's not native in a way that it's, it's you write it in our language and it's compiling behind uh, under the hood. And I think SwiftUI is a lot faster as well mm. because we're seeing those views update rapidly, which is incredible. So mm. yeah, it's good fun. Nice. And do you? Um, so I recently had the opportunity to do some React Native development. Definitely love hate thing there. Do you prefer the the like inline styling that SwiftUI uses versus kind of the separate style sheet? You touched on this before, but I'm interested in hearing about. Yeah, that. it's it's really interesting the syntax they chose for SwiftUI because um, order really matters of how you mm -hmm. do things. But for me, that was an absolute relief having uh, done IB design models that didn't work and. Uh, things wouldn't render. I mean, even something simple, like I'm just going to say it because everyone's going to understand this. If you want to add a clip shape around something and add a shadow behind it, I mean, this is like, it shouldn't have to be this difficult uh, because <laughs> it'll clip that shadow away. And everyone has this question, uh, all the junior developers that join where I work, how do you add a shadow but behind a circle? And, you know, and thankfully, um, love or hate the syntax, it's really straightforward to read in this order. If you do it in the right order, things will work which is a real relief, you know. Um, you don't have to have quirks to it, it's just straightforward. What happens, uh, so I briefly played around a little bit of Swift UI. So you add padding by doing that, right? Like you chain a padding call after you create the structure. What happens if yeah, you chain so, multiple paddings? Yeah, so on, e on, each, on each one, it will affect, it almost wraps the view as it goes down. Um, so in the order that you do it, it would, it would have an effect. If you keep adding padding to something, then it, it will, keep adding it but the the example i was talking about was i think in the course we added like a, a cat shaped round raised space like the cats <laughs> owned us as their pets that's the real truth that's going on here right cats run the universe so we had to <laughs> truth <figure out. laughs> this, this is my humor again you let, you let me do whatever i want it. <laughs> too much coffee you know uh, <laughs> i don't even remember writing it to be honest uh, but that's a lot of coffee <laughs> yeah it's a lot of coffee yeah so but um, basically, if you look at the effect at the end of the day, you know, there's a cat shape around Ray and he has little whiskers and you can like replace him with another pet because you don't like him anymore and um, <laughs> want another one with like Katie or Jesse or whatever. But like basically, great actually, app. Yeah, you should, you should build it up. Um, but basically, we had to draw the shape around them to, to clip them. So you would start with the image, then you would clip the image, and then you would add the shadow to the image. And so if you didn't do it in that order, then you would clip the shadow out. Oh, uh, I see. That, that makes was, sense. So you'd add the clip and then the shadow and then any padding you wanted after that so that it was the right size. So. And each modification basically creates a new view, so to speak. So you have a view and you add padding. Now you've got a view with padding. If you do another padding, you're padding the view with padding. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a conversation when, how, how is that thing going to lay itself out with all those views, you know? and. Um, basically, when you've wrapped all these things with the modifiers, uh, essentially it will go down to see, okay, where do I even start to lay this view out? What's the most flexible child I've got? What's the least flexible child I've got? And the, the math of how it works is actually pretty incredible. Um, come back into the, the avocado toast example, just after he <laughs> mentions that, he has a great diagram showing you how things are laid out and the conversation that happens. But the great news is, is we have no you know, constraint errors and it really should just lay out correctly. 
I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult to lay something out in the center of a screen. Um, and StackFuse <laughs> kind of <laughs> got us close. Um, but the new stacks, H stacks, uh, Z stacks, V stacks, they just did a great job in taking all the pain of this away. Oh, no, no, no. Aren't they Z stacks? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, how many videos I had to re record because I said Z stack? Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, and they're like, yeah, Z stack. <laughs> Have to record again, you know. So, oh no, start fun. the whole show from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so we talked about the fact that this is only available on iOS 13, and it's only available in the latest ones. Timeline-wise, we we've talked about the fact that you know there's a lot that's there, but could be changing. One of the questions I love asking guests is, we have let's say we have Apple engineers listening. If you had a wish list for SwiftUI at this stage, having, having uh, dove in so deeply, what, what are some of the things that you feel you'd like to see improved or changed, et cetera? I think it would be great for the compiler to tell you exactly where the issue is, um, especially in more complex hierarchies. Um, it's something just difficult to know where things are going wrong. I'm not sure how possible that is, but it would be great if it could say, you know, you've passed this in, this is wrong here. Uh, but often the case, it's maybe got you doing a Sherlock Holmes trying to find out where that actually might be. <laughs> so that would be good. Also, personally, if it was me and they were listening, I would say, how does that function builder syntax work? <laughs> just, <laughs> just tell me, I won't tell anyone else. Uh, <laughs> you know, <that's, laughs> because now, none of us really know. Two weeks, after the show, you're gonna get, two weeks after the show, you're going to get mail from Apple. <laughs> well, I was hoping they would a actually take me there and show me. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a letter will do, but I would, you know, if they could take me there and show me, I'd be fine. You know, um, you know, it's top secret. You know, um, implant the knowledge in my mind. But it really uh, does bother me uh, how clever it is, and also how little I know about it. Um, I feel like I rely on it rather than with UI kit. I could really say, uh, you know, I'm not good with scroll views. I'm going to spend a week on scroll views and master this thing and the pains that that would bring, but the rewards at the end. But with this, it's just. It just works. And I, think I suppose we should clarify that while Swift itself is open source and you can look and plumb its depths, Swift UI is proprietary to Apple. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, um, it, it keeps you guessing for some of these magical things. It's definitely proprietary. Um, it would be great to see how they envision the architecture uh, looking for a normal uh, application. Um, you know, your average iOS app, before they were comfortable with telling us it was MVC back in the day, and all their examples would follow the model view controller example. But they kind of gave us apps now uh, without really telling us what to do with it, which is kind of cool. It didn't help me when I was making the course because I was just trying to make these view model -y things that weren't really view models. And, and so they're probably just waiting to see what people do, but it would be cool to see if they have a vision for how we do something like MVVM mm -hmm. and SwiftUI how the things should talk to each other. Uh, because I have seen some kind of questionable uh, uses of maybe the environment object where everything becomes global. Oh, wow. uh, and it seems like we're moving back to, you know, singletons and global singletons the way some people were using it. But um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, uh, how they're going to circumvent that. But uh, the way that I saw that working was if you had a user model, it should be accessible to the whole app, but you shouldn't really be, you know, making loads of those kind of things. Mm. Um, so it'd be good if they gave us examples. Yeah, I, I noticed one of the things at WWDC, which which really, um, for lack of a better term, annoyed me. Uh, and it wasn't just Swift UI; it was Swift UI and Combine, which we'll talk about in about four weeks. Uh, was the fact that both of them were pretty much an island to themselves. They talked about Swift UI and they focused on Swift UI, but not necessarily how to bring its architecture in with an app of other technologies or how the general design pattern should be used for an app as a whole. And I was very surprised that they were the Swift UI classes and the combined classes, but that may just mean that, you know, you had two different development teams working on their secret projects and they didn't have a lot of time to, to talk to each other. And maybe we'll see a lot more of that next year is like how to, how to unify this into one app. But it was very surprising that you could do very complex Swift UI, um, interfaces, but then you didn't really know how to tack that on to the rest of the application. Yeah, and again, I think this is something that things like RxSwift tried to solve, 
Um, and I think Apple have come along with their kind of solution and their answer to it. Um, but the problem with RX was that it didn't tie in nicely with the UI sort of side of things, quite simply, whereas now we have the solution, but how do we do it? Yeah. <laughs> how, do we, how do we do it? What's the pieces? Uh, and just show us how we, sh- how we should do it. You know. Have you, um, I'm interested in what the community has been talking about for architecture for Swift UI. Have there been any sort of patterns that people have started circling around or is it still kind of wild west? It is wild west and I like that because everything is complete free for all. Yeah. Um, it's not been like that for a long time. I said that to Ray, it's kind of cool um, that you know, we'll try and say, we'll do, that, do things this way and people are like, nope, I'm done it this way and this works. <laughs> we'll do it this entirely yeah. different system. Yeah, yeah and it's fun. kind of exciting because I've not had that for so long. Um, but I think the pattern that I see um, is people are trying to use a kind of view model thing Hmm. where they'll abstract the model away from the view Hmm. and some of that logic is kept outside, which is good. Um, The real key thing is how do we actually test this? Um, You know, if we're writing real apps, we need to make sure we're testing our logic and things. And with MVVM, we have a solution. With SwiftUI, it's still kind of uh, anyone's guess how we're going to properly test the logic and the UI and how the UI updates. Interesting. Have you, has anyone started talking about using Redux? In the iOS, I know that uh, that kind of conversation has come up a lot in the Flutter world, just because you know React kind of took that declarative UI, and then has this whole other state system on top of it. So, yeah, there's the people. Redux is fantastic the way it works. It's a very small library, and so people have already implemented it and in, in using you know, Swift UI and things. Uh, I've never actually used uh, that yet, but I still don't know how that's going to benefit you. Uh, from a full application point of view, uh, I would like to see it implemented. I've just seen small examples of people trying to go that direction. Um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I am surprised because uh, one of the things that you gave me on the notes was that it, not only is it easier for new developers to learn, but even your kids have gotten some views on the screen. Yeah. And, and nine is the old one, so, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I'll be honest, I, all of my kids, they are learning to code. Um, they, I, I see, um, I tell them, they must get bored listening to me talking about a time in, in history when reading and writing became life and death. And if you couldn't do it, you were left behind. And I said, that's, that's programming, kids. That's what we need to do. And they're brought up in a house where I'm coding all the time. So um, when Swift UI came out, I mean, they type in circle and a circle appears on the screen. They type in dot color red then it becomes red. I mean, it's so simple for them to use. So I had the kids drawing little shapes and stuff and things on the screen, and they quite enjoyed it. Um, it you know, it's definitely the barrier is way lower in that, that, in that sense. We, we had playgrounds originally, but they were still quite complicated. Uh, and it, this is much more, you know, less language dependent now. It's just very straightforward building blocks. So, yeah, they enjoyed that for about one day and then went back to what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like... Uh, Swift UI is going to bring a ton of benefits around ease of coding, kind of a lot of magic in there, a lot of less knowledge of um, the existing UI platform, and just a lot of advancements in uh, writing UI for Apple Watch, Mac OS, iOS. It sounds like some really awesome stuff going on there. Um, Drew, you had mentioned some pain points you had recently uh, dealing with MVVM. I'd love to hear about that. Oh, gosh. So... Um, so I have been working pretty much in small companies or independent companies for a while where, you know, little companies where the iOS team consisted of me. Um, a couple of years back, I was working in uh, a larger team with Agile and picked that up, but pretty much everything was in an MVC world. And when you're working full time, you're pretty much heads down and trying to get as much of the work done rather than saying, well, this is a new topic. I'm really interested in picking that up. And it's especially hard when you do something like the Ray Wenderlich podcast because I, every two weeks you hear about this fantastic technology and you're researching it coming up to the episode and then you look at it a little after the episode and then you have to put it on a plate and put it on the shelf. So I really hadn't had a chance to get into MVVM until my current job, which instead of me being on an iOS team of me, is an iOS team of roughly 75. (laughs) And the Android team of 75. And all of the support 
folks and all of the scrum masters and, and, and it's just, and it's coming at me at, at high speeds. And the architects of this thing before I even came on said, oh yeah, this is all going to be done MVVM. So this is, this is baptism by fire, but okay. I will tell you when you see MVVM done correctly, it is graceful. It is, it is beautiful because it really does take a lot of what has made, you know, MVC, which became, you know, view model controller, which became view model massive overly stocked <laughs> controller. All of a sudden, everything is unto itself. You've got a whole series of extensions but seeing the actual model view, uh, the view model taken out unto itself really becomes, like I said, artistic. It's, it, it is a bit of a journey. And I will admit that for my first issue that I was presented about two weeks ago, it was a lot of code copying. But, but it is definitely something that if you've been in an MVC world, you want to take the time to look at MVVM. It will clean your code a lot. It'll make your code a lot more readable. Um, it may be a little obfuscated in some ways initially, and it may seem redundant in some ways, but that redundancy actually does make things like dependency injection a lot easier. Um, you, you've got that level of abstraction away from the controller that allows you to say this is just what's being pushed into the view rather than what's coming from the model. And I really like that, that division there. Yeah, I've been using MVVM on Android for a bit now, and I also find it to be a very refreshing sort of um, way to chop up your application. It feels like, it feels like a very natural expression of what is UI and what is sort of presentation logic, which I felt like, I think that both the Android and iOS worlds have been kind of searching for for a while. So it's mm -hmm. nice to feel something that they're kind of settling on. And we'll see if Swift UI kind of blows that all up, but yeah. I'll be honest with the, with the, the state management of Swift UI, I really feel that MVVM will lend itself well. Mm -hmm. Uh, to Swift UI. I know it's very Wild West right now and, and everybody wants to do what works best for them, but this concept of you've got your model, you've got your view model, your view model and your state really seem to be able to do a very good balancing act with each other. Laurie, how's your MVVM? Yeah, the, we use MVVM a lot in our projects. Um, also used MVP, um, but the reason I like MVVM better is that the views can bind themselves directly to the data. And I think you just said it there that Swift UI specializes in doing that. So <laughs> we don't have to use sort of different technologies to do that. Usually you'd have to use KVO or some callbacks. There wasn't a clear solution, but now I think it's going to really help. But yeah, I love using MVVM. Do you want to explain MVP to the, the folks who've never touched that before? Yeah, MVP is um, it's kind of similar and it's trying to break up the model view controller issue, massive view controller issue, cough. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> so, but MVP will basically um, detach the view uh, from the model and every time something happens on the view, it will talk to the presenter, which will tell the view what to do basically in that instance. So it means you can test logic, interaction logic or um, your actual model logic. So it is the, 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 the wealth of information of design patterns is worth the study. It seems to always be something that is separate from the linguistic programming, the language programming of uh, Swift or Kotlin or any of the languages. But take the time to look into design patterns and understand how they work because that really helps get a more organized system of code, helps you minimize a code. It's, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll talk uh, throughout the season on solid and, and the approach of, of really good code design uh, as things go on. But uh, I, I definitely, my, my journey into MVVM, while it's, it's still early, it is still an adventure that I'm really enjoying being on in that sort of high speed drinking from the fire hose kind right. of way.
That's the best type of learning when everything's <laughs> just coming at you and you can't keep up with it. That's what uh, I mean, I love, I love working for a place where I, I come home every day saying I, I learned something new yeah. today. Um, that, that's what keeps work exciting. Yeah, it's, Laura, it's great to have developers who have kept that momentum going with learning because learning is great fun, but sometimes it's good to have one of those guys in the team who just wants to keep it going. Yeah. Uh, they've got a bit of experience with everything. It really helps. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have a lot of stuff in the show notes from this episode, including some of the courses that Laurie has put together so that you can see uh, some of the material that's available. And that uh, also, you know, we invite people to contribute on the forums if they have any questions concerning things they've heard on the show. We all have access to, uh, to respond to those forums as best we can. Uh, I, Laurie, I'd love to talk to you after WWDC this year to see what they've done to SwiftUI. What will you do this year? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have yeah, to understand. I, I remember when they first introduced OS X, but it was the year before they introduced it as OS X. They introduced a, a program called Rhapsody. And Rhapsody's entire purpose was to finally destroy what was known as Copeland. Uh, Copeland. If you're a historian, Copeland was the uh, transition away from the old pre-OS X world of OS 8, OS 9, and all of that. But Copeland was a disaster that never came out, and then they introduced Rhapsody. And then the following year, they said, so what was this Rhapsody thing we were talking about? We thought they had just Copeland Rhapsody, but they turned it into <laughs> OS X. I, I always have this terror that they're going to come out and go, so what was this Swift UI thing that we were trying? <laughs> but I'm, pre I'm pretty sure never that Swift UI is... <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Swift UI is here to stay and grow and, and become really one of those things that at some point they'll come up on stage and go, so why do we think you should be making all your code in Swift UI now? And yeah, it'll yeah, be as fun, much it'll fun future. But I Laura, think the, uh, go ahead. No, sorry. All right. The courses on Ray like now are very much supporting Swift UI. I think we all know that's definitely the way forward. I think the debate between should we use storyboards, should we use nibs, should we write in code, and all the people in their, their sort of fortresses that wouldn't talk to each other now are coming together. <laughs> and it, the way forward is going to be clear eventually, so, um, you know, that's helped. And it's one big happy family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finally, like the two <laughs> sides could put down their weapons and, and come together <laughs> in love and harmony. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the Ray Wenderlich way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lori, I really want to thank you for your time. It, it's been great learning about Swift UI. It's been great having you here. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying the afternoon as we've been scratching our way through the early morning hours. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the show and I appreciate everyone getting up so early for me in my <laughs> weird time zone here. It's been a real, real privilege and uh, thanks to everyone who's done the course and people who helped me put it together uh, on the Ray Bendelik team. Uh, next show in two weeks, we're going to bring back Jen Bailey, our uh, co-host from mm. last season, and we're going to flip back over to the Android side. Mm. Woo. <laughs> And we're going to be talking about saving data on Android. Alex, do you want to comment anything about that? Yeah, what a vast, evolving world saving data on Android's been. We've got Room, we've got SQL Delight, all these wonderful solutions. So make sure to stay tuned. Definitely, we'll have that show up, and it will release on the 11th of March, two weeks from the release of this episode. Um, in the meantime... Again, we thank Lori Gray. Alex, I thank yeah. you. You can find Lori on Twitter at code underscore disciple. Is that correct? Yeah, that's me. Love it. Alex is Alex Sullivan 444. I am podcast Drew, D-R-U, on Twitter. You can always reach any of us there. We may not necessarily respond, but you can always <laughs> reach us there. <laughs> we'll read but and I, dismiss. Yeah. But in my head, and then later in editing, I hear music from the podcast world of Ray Wenderlich. We're going to head back to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWenderlich.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time.